Thank you, Libby. Um, I would also, while I am sharing my screen, I also just wanna highlight that I am co-presenting today um, with Lisa Lugo. And Lisa is um, the outreach coordinator and um, a community health worker at Family Health Centers and has graciously agreed to co-present with me. Um, so don't want to forget uh, Lisa. But without further ado, um, we are presenting today on using GIS and community health workers to address comorbid diabetes and depression. Um, I just want to give um, a land acknowledgement in that, um, you know, we are presenting today and also the communities that we're discussing today are in regards to communities currently living on occupied land of the Okanagan. Um, and so a little bit of background in terms of how I came to be doing this. Um, I just last year I graduated from Bastyr University. I got my MPH. Uh, my master's of public health and my capstone project I did, I was lucky enough to work with Lisa um, and family health centers um, in part of the larger population health learning action network they were uh, participating in. And some of their clinic aims with this larger project they were um, working on were looking at diabetes and depression sort of separately. And so I decided my niche was looking at diabetes and depression together. Um, and so that's where uh, sort of my data and in my part of the research uh, has come in. And so um, just to give y'all um, sort of, you know, a, a framework for how we're approaching this, um, one in five adults with diabetes are also struggling with depression. Um, you know, individuals with diabetes are two to three times more likely to have uh, depression than their nine diabetic counterparts. However, only 20 to 50% of those with comorbid type two diabetes and depression actually receive um, a diagnosis of depression and subsequent treatment. So we're seeing some disparities in who's having these diseases, but also um, diagnosis and then treatment. Um, additionally, compared to the general population, uh, Latino individuals with type 2 diabetes are um, two times more likely to have comorbid depression, with about 33% of the community experiencing comorbidity. Um, and additionally, compared to their white counterparts, uh, Latinos are more likely to have overall worse outcomes. This is um, can be particularly true for those who work as migrant and seasonal agricultural workers um, who can be at ad additional risk due to associations between um, incidents of diabetes and exposure to certain pesticides. And so, you know, we know that diabetes and depression are related. We don't really know how though. It's a pretty um, complicated relationship, although we do know that it's bi-directional and it is synergistic. Um, a five-year perspective cohort study that was done by Caton at L found that comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression resulted in 50% greater risk of all-cause mortality, a 24% greater risk of macrovascular complications, um, a 36% greater risk in microvascular complications, and then additional risk for poor medication adherence. Um, another 10-year uh, perspective cohort study found that um, both type 2 diabetes plus depression resulted in um, 1.97 times greater mortality than those who just had uh, diabetes but no depression. We do see um, that depression in diabetes leads to worsening glycemic control, um, which you know we know that the glycemic control is a determining factor in the development of diabetic outcomes. Um, and so with uh, an average increase in hemoglobin A1C of 1%, um, which has been seen with comorbid um, type 2 diabetes and depression, and, and we know that that is clinically significant. And so why do depression and type 2 diabetes interact this way? Some of the pieces um, are that depression understandably alters ability to engage in self-management for diabetes. Um, self-management for diabetes often um, involves lots of moving parts. Um, and if you're depressed, you're less likely to be able to, to want to do those or to be able to do those. Um, depression can also decrease satisfaction with medical care and thus decrease adherence. Um, however, it, several of these studies also found that despite the known effect of depression on health behaviors that adversely affect diabetes management, the increase in hemoglobin A1C um, because of depression 
was not conspicuously a result of factors um, such as obesity or non-adherence. Um, and actually that Caton study controlled for things like socioeconomic factors, different health risk, um, health behavior risk factors. And so with those things controlled for, we're sort of left wondering, okay, why are we then seeing um, depression and type 2 diabetes interact this way? And so this really leads me to the conversation around chronic stress. Um, we know that chronic stress leads to chronic activation um, of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and as well as the sympathetic nervous system. And that in turn leads to chronic elevated cortisol levels, which then in turn leads to insulin resistance, um, reduced responses from our neural reward systems, uh, increased, increased production of inflammatory cytokines, which again sort of feeds back into insulin resistance, reduced response from neural reward systems. And so I think it's important not to forget the role of chronic stress in comorbid chronic diseases, particularly type 2 diabetes and depression. Um, and I think the importance of examining that is because then it leads us back to conversations of equity and social determinants of health. As a determinant of health, I just, I'm gonna read this quote because I think it um, packs a punch, but as a determinant of health, medical care is insufficient for ensuring better health, health outcomes. The social determinants of health account for 80 to 90% of modifiable contributors to health outcomes, while medical care accounts for only 10 to 20 percent. And so with this, again, just bringing it back to the fact that we have to start having those conversations, and, and we have been, but really focusing on those conversations around um, social determinants of health um, and how they are impacting uh, distribution of chronic disease. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I came across it in my research that I was doing for this project, um, and I, I found it to be really interesting, and it's um, an epidemiological framework called syndemic theory, and it's defined as the synergistic co-occurrence of two or more diseases that is precipitated or exacerbated by social and economic inequality and results in an increased burden of disease for a particular population requires three characteristics, one of which is clustering or frequency of comorbidity of two or more diseases in a population, interaction between comorbid diseases, and presence of social and economic adversity that promotes the comorbidity and disease interaction. And so I would argue that this framework um, would be an important one to look at comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression through. Um, and so finally, getting to sort of the role of geographic information systems in addressing chronic disease. Prior to this research, um, I had never utilized GIS. Um, now I'm so very excited to continue utilizing it um, with any projects that I do uh, with my public health degree. Um, GIS um, really expands our focus of public health efforts beyond the individual and allows us to contemplate how place and space shape the distribution of chronic diseases. And from that point, how to then promote health equity and inform public health action. Um, we've seen that through the creation of spatial analyses, we can um, reinforce a non-random distribution of chronic disease. We can emphasize the appropriate use of policy um, based upon what communities um, chronic disease is occurring um, in. We can inform resource allocation, uh, develop culturally appropriate programming, again, based upon where we're seeing uh, chronic disease occurring in the population. And then um, spatial analyses can really help improve collaboration across professions. Um, you know, having a visual of a map in front of you allows a lot of different professions who think in very different ways to come to the table in a common way. Um, and so for my project, I um, Family Health Centers uses Athena Health um, electronic health record systems. And so I essentially use Azara, which is a health data reporting system to get informa patient information from Athena and then to help me put it into Esri, um, which is the ArcGIS program that I used um, to make the, the maps that I'm gonna show you in just a little bit. Um, and essentially I took, um, got uh, records from Athena for all the patients that Family Health Center serves um, 
that have type 2 diabetes and depression um, and then used a de-identified zip code um, to map where they were occurring um, in Okanagan County. And so um, just again, I'm going to do some basic descriptive analyses that I went through um, just to uh, set the stage as it were. Um, so we did find that the majority of Family Health Center's patients um, currently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes identify as Hispanic Latino. Of the 286 patients with type 2 diabetes who also had a hemoglobin A1C that was nine or greater, um, the majority also identified as Hispanic Latino. And so these two bullet points we're seeing are in line with the current research and that um, the Latino community has disproportionately has a burden of type 2 diabetes and they disproportionately have um, worse outcomes. The next bullet point um, is in regards to patients that had both a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and depression, the majority actually identified as non-Hispanic Latino, um, which is not what I was expecting based upon the, you know, my previous research that I'd done um, in preparing for this. That's not what I was expecting to see. Um, and we'll touch later why um, we think that that might be true um, for this population. And then for patients with comorbid diabetes and depression that also had a hemoglobin A1C of nine or greater, um, we actually did see more who identified as Hispanic Latino um, versus non-Hispanic Latino. And you know, when you're looking at these percentages, it's 43.8% Hispanic Latino versus 41.7% non-Hispanic Latino. Those, it doesn't seem like a very large difference, but when taken in the context of the bullet point above, we're, we're actually not seeing that more um, of the Latino community that Family Health Center serves has comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression. Um, it is interesting, um, or it is, you know, it says something that that population still has worse outcomes as evidenced by a hemoglobin A1C of nine or greater, even though they don't make up the majority that have com uh, comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression. All right, and so this first slide um, is just showing the total number of patients in each zip code that have type 2 diabetes. And I'll give a caveat in that um, I looked at 16 zip codes total. Um, I had patient data for 16 zip codes. Some of the zip codes will not be shown on the maps um, simply due to the fact that they had less than um, 10 patients per zip code. And in efforts of protecting patient privacy, I thus didn't include them. On, on the map. So uh, just keep that in mind going forward. Um, and so we can see here that 98812 um, with the, in the dark purple uh, is, has, is bearing the brunt of a number of patients in each zip code that have type 2 diabetes. Um, they had 27.8% um, of the patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and this zip code is pre predominantly uh, Latino based upon census tract data. Um, and additionally to 98812 and 98813 are um, the zip codes that Family Health Center South Clinics are located in. And they, um, you know, even aside from census tract data, they, are, they do serve a larger um, Latino population. And so this second map is showing a percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes in each zip code that have a hemoglobin A1C of nine or greater. Again, we're seeing here that 98812 sort of bearing um, more of the brunt of that, um, about 33.8% of patients um, with uh, type 2 diabetes and a hemoglobin A1C of nine or greater were located in that zip code. Um, Surprisingly, 98855 came in a close second here, um, which is a little surprising just being that it's um, a predominantly white zip code, but it's not, in terms of um, ethnicity, it's not that different than other predominantly white zip codes in the area. Um, and there wasn't, when I was looking again at census tract data, there wasn't a lot of difference between um, annual income with those zip codes either. And so, 98855 is a little bit of a mystery um, at the moment. This third map is looking at percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes in each zip code that have comorbid um, depression. And so again, here we're seeing sort of what panned out in our descriptive analyses in that 
um, we aren't seeing what we expect um, in terms of a higher percentage of patients being sort of more in the 98812, 98813 zip codes. Um, and so we're seeing 98841 and 98855. Um, and those, um, as I said earlier, are predominantly white zip codes. Um, and so we're, again, this, this information is like not what I was expecting with this research. Um, and when I presented it to um, providers at family health centers um, late last year, they actually were saying that um, while they're not sure about 98841, they were saying that 98855 is, they're not surprised that that's showing up sort of across the maps and that that area is really mountainous and a lot of their patients that live in those zip codes um, don't um, have great access in terms of healthcare. And so they were feeling like maybe that was the reason why those zip code uh, codes were showing up as they did. And then this last map, um, again, we're working with, you know, as I added more layers of data analysis on our patient numbers dwindled and dwindled. So this map is only showing two zip codes, again, just in efforts of protecting patient privacy, um, but we're looking at percentage of patients with both type 2 diabetes and depression in each zip code um, that have a hemoglobin A1C of 9 or greater. Um, again, we're seeing 98841, which is a predominantly white zip code, um, have the higher percentage, while 98812 has a lower percentage, predominantly Latino. Um, but again, it's I think it's important to con consider this in the context of even though we're not seeing that um, the predominantly Latino zip codes are bearing a brunt of comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression, um, they're still bearing the brunt of a higher percentage of those who have type 2 diabetes and depression, but then have worse outcomes from it as evidenced by the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and so something uh, I think important to consider when we're sort of considering this data overall and what it means for the patient population that we're serving. Um, and so just um, to sort of summarize um, everything I walked y'all through, this pilot study, um, I think highlights the inequities of chronic disease distribution in Okanagan County um, among patients at family health centers. Um, and again, when I brought this to the provider meeting, they were like, oh yeah, like we see this clinically. Um, and so I feel like it's important that even when you're seeing something clinically and you know something to be true because you're on the ground doing the work, you see it in real life, I think it can be important to then have that data to support sort of larger scale changes um, that you might wanna be making um, in efforts of changing what you're seeing on the ground. Um, additionally, it supports that uh, Latino communities suffer disproportionately from uh, type two diabetes and worse health outcomes associated with diabetes. Um, and I think this study provides a strong foundation upon which further research can be done. I think my preference for the sort of the most important next step um, is really conducting research on the depression and mental health um, in the Latino population of Okanagan County to see if there's something that we're missing. Like when I look at the data and when I look at the maps, am I seeing a lack of comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression in the Latino community because it's not there in this uh, in this county and in, in this community, or are we missing something somehow? Are we not screening appropriately? Are there um, cultural differences in how we are seeing depression versus um, someone who's Latino is experiencing or describing depression? You know, there are lots of different things where we might be missing the mark. Um, and so trying to do some additional research to see if what we're seeing is actually the truth or if we need to be doing more um, in terms of mental health support with the community. Um, and then additionally, evaluating other social determinants of health, influencing type 2 diabetes and depression. Um, so looking at being able to map places um, where it's safe to like recreational spaces where people feel safe to go outside and um, move their bodies or um, 
you know, mapping where grocery stores that have fresh fruits and veggies reliably are in the county. Um, things like that and seeing how distance or closeness is affecting where we're seeing the distribution of comorbid type 2 diabetes and depression. Um, and so without further ado, I will turn it over to my co-presenter, uh, Lisa, for her section. Thank you, Logan. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Lugo. I'm community workers at Family Health Centers. I, I am very happy to be here. So let's talk about the our goal for part two of the presentation. And um, we are discuss about the whole person health model and look at example of how family health centers community health worker has approached on diabetes and depression as health educator. Discuss a resource use and design to address the, the need our community and review tools to get started with this model. Also discuss how community health worker plays a vital to role in this successful implementation. The role of community health workers um, has expanded from outreach and education to working within a clinical team in primary care setting. Our objective is to improve the self-care of patients with the type 2 diabetes by incorporating um, community health workers as members of clinical teams. Whole person health and the role of community health workers. We are collaborating with diabetes and hair care teams. We available to receive to referrals from our medical or behavioral provider. And the provider identify the, our patient, but the community health worker are also in the position to identify these patients. We consult with the PCP through patient care case to offer necessary care. From, from my experience, um, many patients don't offer all necessary information at the time of their medical visit. So um, community health worker through uh, we meet with the patient through questions and review of the patient's daily activity, identify situ situation that can affect the patient's uh, patient health. Also, the community health worker with uh, meets with the patients by one hang off or medical appointment or st staff alert. And we identify overcome culture barrier to self care or behavior health. Be, sorry, behavior change. And consult with the patient about barrier to care and social determination, or protocol for responding and assessing patient assets, risk, and experience. Family Health Center is a leader uh, in the treatment of chronic conditions, including diabetes. We, we have a team that combines certified providers, doctors, nurses, and community health workers who work closely with the patient to manage their chronic conditions. Our approach uh, includes individual diabetes management coaching. Here, uh, here the patient has the opportunity to receive help one-on-one will go get the better understand on his condition. Also, we offer diabetes management family coaching 
and we invited the families um, example the wife or daughters and to include in the include in the coaching and the family has the opportunity to learn more about diabetes management uh, we also listen the fears and needs of the patient the <clears throat> of the patient this approach um, open doors and uh, to the member of the family to establish communication links with the patient for support and address his needs Orientation about COVID-19 a vaccine is, um, is our hard work this year and uh, in the pandemic. So at each visit, we make sure that our patients and um, diabetes patients and uh, all com Latin community are well oriented about the necessary vaccine and update on COVID. Also, we offer uh, nutrition. We we offer nutrition and lifestyle alternative, uh, like Dash diet, Mediterranean diet, and others. We also go to grocery shopping together and teach how to read the labels, identify products high in sodium, fats carbohydrates, also focus on fresh um, fresh produce and visit farmer, farmer markets to support local vendors. And community health worker also, we working um, closely with the providers and we help the patient in weight loss control. And, we offer tips and advice on how to overcome weight management challenges. For patient motivation with delivery of folder that include tools and information on how to make the best decision when do a meal or physical, or physical activity. Also, we take a page, uh, we take a patient weight, uh, measure waist, hip, neck, and um, fat percent to motivate the patient. With this, with this, PCP has the opportunity to evaluate uh, the progress for the patient. And we include in our program a cooking class. And for cooking class, we offer alternative for healthier um, recipes, um, the different culture, um, Latin culture, um, Mexican, um, Colombia, Puerto Rico. We include um, different recipes about <clears throat> in our cooking classes. The Depression management through mindfulness, um, we offer um, mindfulness um, yoga class. Um, most chronic conditions such as diabetes have a strongly physiological impact that determines the patient experience and reaction to it. The practice of mindfulness helps with the reduction of stress and negative emotion and improving in the patient attitude, health-related behavior and coping skill. Um, managing managing um, diabetes can be difficult to when it's not fully understood. So we try a uh, co community health workers and our team and try to cover each um, uh, each step. Working communication. Uh, internal communication stands out in our essential character 
as a fundamental aspect that allow us to create a solid, integral, and proactive culture <clears throat> with accessibility to service of excellence. Our internal communication includes uh, communication channels within our team, including call center team, Google chat. We have a transition to Google Hangout and clinical team huddle and department huddle group chat with medical team. Also, a good communication with the provider. And the call center team, we work very close in order to offer personalized attention and offer a good user experience. Um, we use these different communication models. Here we discuss the new rules, the staff that will be available every day, also give us the opportunity to plan patient care and monitoring before visit. It's more easy for us. When a patient gets referred um, to us, to the community health workers, a community health worker certified in chronic disease management and nutrition assess patient conditions. We discuss a uh, treatment offered by the providers, and we create a strategic plan based on the needs of the patient. Of the patient. For example, considering worship, time to get up, rest, meals, time to share with the family, communications, bio biological needs, work hours, time to follow economic capacity and environment and some writings. What are the steps uh, to diabetes education? And diabetes education is for both uh, the patient and family members. Um, we we work in uh, we're the team and we follow four step or follow four visit for education. And in the first step and um, support understanding of what, of diabetes. Uh, what is diabetes? What are the signs and symptoms? What leads to diabetes? And support disease monitoring and formulate an action plan with the patients. A step two is feedback. Uh, when the patient go back to the second visit. So um, we have a feedback and discuss a health eating plan and men menu planning and help patients develop a routine for healthy eating and review action plan for any change or addictions. Mo most patients um, in the second visit and continue with the same action plan. And in the third and step, we change uh, for or include another action plan. In the third visit, um, we have a feedback on both and step one and two and discuss monitoring log and discuss any emotion that might be coming up, um, integration of medication and mindfulness, um, stress management skill. And we can um, doing another um, medical appointment um, for doing and um, just coverage mindfulness and discuss the importance of physical activity and exercise and review the action plan for any change and addiction. Uh, 
Um, let's talk about next, the last step. Um, in the last step, um, we feedback and follow the on step one, two, and three and discuss the strategies for working with the healthcare provider and review the action plan for any change or additions. <clears throat> um, additionally, we create the follow visit for food and eye exam, vaccination as, as well as individual and family coaching. If the patient needs more coach, uh, we can include the family or we can coach in um, another um, visit to, to get more information or support. Let's talk about this data. This data show of the progress of the patient after being the third, six, and nine months in the whole person health model program. Um, the, the first line is, I choose the, our last 19 um, patients in our program. And in the first one, the, this patient have the A1C in 13, um, is our first visit. And in the second visit, and the patient start the program and the patient go down um, 11. And when the patient have uh, nine months in the program, improve um, the A1C down to six in nine months. Um, it, each line is different patients and all patients. Uh, I try to include the overnight. Um, we have a great, great opportunity to, to contact with the patient and improve the A1C. The physician and community health workers had a positive impact uh, on patient and self-care skills and clinical outcomes. Patient and phys physician also had higher satisfaction with general care. In addition, um, resources, and we include the support group and um, is the favorite for, for the patient. <laughs> and for many people at Health Relators support group can fill a gap between medical treatment and the need for emotional support. Support group provide an opportunity to share personal experience and feelings. They, they are aimed um, at anyone who wants to educate themselves on health and personal development issues in creative way where we can call or learn by knowing each other. We help people understand that even if they have chronic illness, they can control the quality of their life, um, both physically and emotionally. Some of the strategies that we integrate in our groups are related to the wellness wheel, and we have a one, one year uh, calendar and to keep people active and ahead with the day-to-day -day needs. Okay, let's talk about our support group. In this picture, uh, we show the different uh, workshop we offer in our support group. Um, we offer mindfulness, and we offer yoga class, and the first picture um, is the popular workshop 
and the people enjoy in this workshop and I learned a lot for our community. So is the know yourself and in this workshop reflect on ourselves uh, as a person and individual self-esteem, identify a, a life or work project we can help. Um, also, uh, we offer parenting love and logic classes. Um, Self-love is the other workshop in this workshop, uh, we invited the um, BH um, behavioral health specialists. Um, we offer um, self love, the basis of all success, and is understand the importance of self love in our life. The other popular is financial abundance, and that one. Um, is achieve awake, awakening in each participant their financial intelligence and establish an action plan in the future or three months or nine months. And we working in the whole year for this. And we follow, um, help the participant in working with the action plan. And the other one is hormone of happiness. Okay, the next slides. Other resources is uh, activity groups. We have uh, activity groups uh, design education through games. In the activity groups, uh, we have a walking club. And this walking club is once a week from May to August. And um, we have a lifestyle is a celebration. This is the last activity activity in the calendar. And uh, we celebrate uh, with the pod blog and every participant um, share different food and the different county county. Um, we are enjoying <laughs> and tasty good food. <laughs> And um, in design education through games, um, a critical element in involving patient in hair care decision making in the patient health literacy level. We offer tools and technique that the patient needs through memory games. The aim on the game is to discover and learn about the diabetes related conditions, symptoms, and risks. And the most important uh, is the medical vocabulary and terminology. And the people enjoy the game and learn a lot about the diabetes condition. And internal resources and uh, we have in our clinic and reduce rate policy and um, family health center has established a program that reduce fees charge to qualifying um, patient based on income at family size and the community health workers um, bring orientation about that about the about the and medical insurance and enrollment and we offer also the our program for reduced speed. Athena Health and we working at Athena Health patient portal about one year and a half and the patient portal give the access to healthcare information online 24 hours a day. And the patient have an opportunity to can request appointment, um, view lab results and check your, check your medication or from your home computer or smartphone. Uh, we teach in the the patients and community how we can do it. And we offer um, 
we offer uh, Wi-Fi to 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 join to the smartphone or computer too. Other community resources, um, community health workers, and collaborate with local agency to increase access to to care and facilitate facilitate appropriate use of our community resources. Um, these our this brochure we bring to the patients and here we bring um, so many resources we have in our community and we have in Spanish and English. We have a uh, bring school information, um, child care, um, emergencies, um, legal assistance, um, housing. Um, we bring so many information about all um, resources we have in our in our community. Thank you, everyone. Um, we can go with Dr. Logan. Yeah, so um, I know we're, we got through our presentation really quickly, and I feel like that was probably my fault. I sped through my part really quickly, probably due to nerves, so I, I will apologize to the translators um, for that. Um, but I, uh, Lisa talking about the um, Athena made me remember something that I wanted to touch on um, earlier that I forgot to, and that when I was taking um, data from Athena, it was right after family health centers had switched from their old EHR to the new Athena. And there were some, um, not issues getting the data, but like recognition that um, not all of the patient records had been fully transferred from the old EHR to Athena by the time I was pulling the data. Um, and so if I had done this study now, um, say a year and a half or I think almost two years actually after um, the switch to Athena had been made, I would probably have more um, significantly more um, patient records. We ended up having a total of, um, I think it was 1,161 total patient records that I used for um, creation of the maps. Um, and so I know one of my interests is like, if I went back in now, um, would I see with greater patient numbers, would I see a, a significant difference in how the distribution of type 2 diabetes and depression is occurring in the county. Um, and then additionally, one of the things that got brought up when um, I was doing this and that was that there were additionally, you know, when I, some of you might, who are math whizzes might have noticed when I was presenting some of the data, you know, I was often doing it versus like presenting a certain percentage who identified as Hispanic Latino and then another percentage who identified not Hispanic Latino. Um, but, and, and those two percentages probably didn't add up to 100%. And that was because with every group, we had significant number, I shouldn't say significant because that means something different in statistics, but we had numbers um, that chose not to answer or didn't answer or that we just didn't have that information for. And so I also am wondering like if we'd actually had better data in terms of an ethnicity that someone was identifying as, would that additionally have changed um, the distribution that we were seeing? Um, and I think some of that was coming from um, and efforts to speed up check-in processes. Understandably, those questions weren't always being asked of patients um, by the front desk. And so it, I think this research shows the importance of actually having you know, that information, um, even though sometimes it, it feels suppressed and it's like taking extra time to do. To do. Um, but yeah, like just, yeah, it's showing the importance of um, 
reassuring, you know, all of your staff um, that you work with that, that all of these things are important measurements. Um, and, and this is, is why. Um, so we can start Q and A, um, but I also wanted to, actually, I'm gonna stop share just so I can see people. Um, let me change my view. I know I personally am interested because we have extra time. Um, so I know at least from my portion of the presentation, I'm really interested in knowing if anyone else has used um, GIS um, with their community health centers that they've worked with or their practices that they're at um, or with any research they have done. And if they um, have, you know, like what the pros and cons um, have been with their experience with that. And so people are welcome to type that in the chat if they don't want to speak up, but um, also if you want to turn your camera or voice or your um, mute button off, that's also fine. Might not get any takers for that, um, which could be because people want to, would want to talk, and I hear that. Um, I know for me, like this, as I said during the presentation, this was my first experience using GIS, um, and hearing when I presented the information to the providers, hearing that this was like a something, even though they knew this from their clinical experience, that having this data was important for moving things forward. Um, I just have a personal interest in knowing how that has worked out in other um, environments and if people have seen that be uh, of success uh, when addressing the concerns of their community or the needs of their community. Logan, could you talk a little bit more on that around, um, like, I know Family Health Centers is amazing, but like, what do the proposal or the steps look like so that like this could be something that y'all could work and spend an energia on and put some of the things in place, like having promotoras also invest time in that. I'd love to hear more if you can talk about that process. Yeah, um, in terms of like the process from um, the, the beginning of making the maps or just like after I have that data, what the, after I have the data, what that looks like. I'm thinking for like colegas on the line from health centers, like if they wanted to do this, um, what would they need to do or pitch to their to their health center leadership to make this possible? Like what are some of the things they need to put in place? Yeah. To do this? Yeah. So um, I will say that I got really lucky with the GIS in that. Um, so I was doing this as a student. So I had sort of a little bit of benefit in that I was doing this for a required um project and so I could be like oh I need x y and z um and luckily enough so ArcGIS is a relatively um inexpensive uh GIS program and for me as a student it was a hundred dollars and I think actually you can get like a um you can get like an educator um, license also for a hundred dollars and it lasts you for a year. Um, so relatively inexpensive. And I think that that, you know, as a CHW, you are an educator. And so I think that, that um, could work in terms of utilizing that to be able to see like, Hey, I need to do this research so that I can better like, so I can give you this data, better serve the things that you're seeing in the patient population. Um, and it only is going to cost a hundred dollars a year. Um, there are additional other GIS systems that, um, like depending on how technologically savvy you are, might be easier to use. I know for me, ArcGIS wasn't like a intuitive, um, uh, platform. And so I, that was difficult. And so if you don't have experience with GIS, trying to find one that's a little more intuitive or additionally, like looking for, um, I know, um, community colleges will also like, uh, frequently have, uh, um, 
um, frequently have classes uh, on learning how to use GIS. And because it's at a community college, those can typically be um, uh, not super pricey. And so if you don't have any experience with that, I would again sort of bring that as a proposal um, and that like, hey, would you be willing to um, fund this um, so that I can get this knowledge in order to be able to produce this data? And I think if, if there's like any, I know I had a little bit of momentum with it in that like FHC was already sort of trying to do this larger scale um, research project with um, the North Central Accountable Communities of Health. And so like there was momentum already it like moving in this direction. And so I just sort of took advantage of that and was like, yes, like I will also use this momentum to be able to, to get this data. Um, and so I think too, if there's like even a hint of wanting, like being curious about chronic disease distribution with your patient population or within the community, or um, there is, you know, like whispers of any sort of research momentum being done, I would try to like add that in. Um, Cause it's really not, it, it's not like, workforce heavy you don't have to have a lot of people doing it or coordinating it um and the uh platforms themselves don't take a lot of financial investment um luckily enough and so i feel like most community health centers um when when dealing with um sort of that chronic disease distribution it would be i feel like well and the maybe that's optimistic to say most would be on board for it, but um, I feel like you can make a good argument for it. Did anyone have um, any questions from any of the material that I presented or any questions for Lisa? I will, I will include, um, so now our focus is um, working with the vaccine with uh, the H2A H2 workers and our farmers in the community. And now we're going to the farmers to bring the orientation about the COVID and orientation about the vaccine and identify people who come to our county to, to do valuable trabajo en la agricultura. <laughs> and we go to the orchard and fill out the form for the vaccine and we fill out the form about the registration for our clinic, uh, new patient registration and we offer the fee, the reduced fee. And when identified the patient have struggling with the diabetes and we include it in our program too. And we offer um, diabetes classes, hypertension and cholesterol in, in the um, field too. Oh. Any questions about our programs? This is a quiet group. <laughs> it is. Colegas, type it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Um, we have 30 more minutes to sit here and platicar. Um, colegas, Liza, I Hola, Lisa. Oh, go for it. Okay. Hi, I'm Alejandro Cruz. I'm a community health worker. I'm here in Perry, New York. Mm. The question that I have is about that Athena health patient portal. Now, uh, Logan, mm -hmm. that's you're in the state of Washington. Is that right? Washington state? Yes. Now, in New York, 
will we be able to get that? I mean, I think that's great to be able to view uh, for a patient from the comfort of their home mm -hmm. to look at their lab results, check medications and all of that. I mean, that's great. But yeah. is that something that, uh, is that what a special app that's, you have a contract, obviously you have it with, you know, in Washington, but is that available in other states? Yeah. Um, thanks for your question. I, that should be available in all states. Um, the only caveat is that um, it has to do with the, so the Athena patient portal is based upon family health centers being contracted with Athena for their electronic health record system, which then allows patients to have access um, to the patient portal. And so if you're not with a, um, a clinic that has Athena, um, you won't be able to use that specifically. However, most electronic health record systems have some version of that. Um, like the, the past year, the clinic that I work at, um, we use Epic and the patient portal for that is my chart. Um, and so it just, I would, I would just look into what EHR you're working with and what the potential for the patient portal is. Cause all of them should, um, be like, utilize the access to like look at medications and lab results and et cetera, and being able to like communicate electronically with providers. Right. I, I just wasn't um, aware of that mm -hmm. because yeah. see, most of the time when I see, I've been doing this job now for uh, six months. In fact, mm -hmm. the end of this month, it would have been six months. And when I take a patient for lab work, then I have to contact the clinic to find out if the doctor got the, info, the results then the mm -hmm. doctor has to analyze it. And then in turn, they give me the information and then I pass it on to uh, the patients who I serve. Right. But I mean, I didn't know that that was possible to do that. I mean, I, that, that's great for a patient to just get on the system and find out yeah. how the blood work is and all of that. And, and when you said check, what do you mean by check medications? Is that just like a list of the medications that they have that you can just keep a record of online. Is that basically it? Is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know some patients too, like I'll have patients who, when they check in for their appointment, they'll have already updated their medication list mm -hmm. via the patient portal. Um, and so that's like a step that you don't have to like do during the visit. Um, you just have to verify that they did it. Um, so that's what I was referring to um, sort of with like, the medication list. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hey. Yeah. Mr. Cruz, I yes. will be doing all. Oh, sorry. That's okay. okay. I was, I was just going to uh, let him know uh, what EHR system or platform is your clinic using? We use what's called ECW. Um, let me see. Uh, it's an acronym for, I mean, I, I, let me double check what the acronym is for, yeah. but it's, that's what it's called, ECW, where we enter all of our patients' information, all of that for scheduling appointments, all of, all of that is done using that system. E-clinical works. You got it. Thanks a lot, man. E-clinical works. Yeah, we're on the same one. Thanks a lot. Great. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Lisa, what, um, what were you going to say? Oh, also this application and the patient have opportunity to reorder, refill medication, send the, the message to refill the medication and have the opportunity to send the message to directly, directly to the provider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said they can request a refill, is that right? Right. And they have, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, request the refill and refill um, and send the, the message to the provider or any question and this message and receive um, the provider and medical assistant too. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Great. Yeah. You're welcome.
I'll go over that with my supervisor here. I'll let her know that I find it very interesting. And uh, for, I mean, uh, is, is anyone who's watching, do you know if we have that capability in eClinical Works? Is the gentleman who said that eClinical Works. I don't know who it was, but he's right. He's the one who cleared that up. Do you know if we have that in ECW? Hi, this is Elvia Anderson. Yes, there's there's capability to do that to generate reports. Okay, well, can patients actually get on the system and get have access to that information? That question, I'm, I'm that answer, I don't know, but I know that the health center can generate those uh, reports. Right. The other, see, I think, all right, because, you know, we here, we, I work for Finger Lakes Community Health, but we also have a voucher program. So I take patients to other clinics that are not part of our clinics. So it gets into that too. So I'll ask my supervisor about that. Mr. Cruz, uh, a clinical works does have the capability of a patient portal. And I believe that's really what you're looking for uh, when you're talking about patient access to their own information. Yes. Uh, it's up to the, yeah, the center uh, IT folks and your vendor uh, representative for eClinical Works there should be able to give you the information about how to use that portal. And actually, um, you've brought up a good point. If, if your center is not making use of that feature, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a great asset to getting new patients registered, to doing pre-screenings, um, because you can actually post for them uh, specific screening tools like the limited pH3 um, for depression screening before moving on to further screenings. So, um, and of course, post their labs there. So there's a lot of opportunity to engage with your patients more closely and for them to have the information ahead of a visit with their- But how, what if they go, what if they go to a clinic that's not part of Finger Lakes Community Health? Uh, your vendor and uh, folks can set it up so that you actually can receive from other locations information about labs and stuff. For instance, here in North Carolina, uh, LabCorp uh, works across many, many different providers. Uh, they're a huge lab system. And so even if the patient went to one uh, that's not in the local community, that information would come back because that patient is linked to that health center. And LabCorp would have that information ahead of time. That's the primary care provider or patient center medical home for that individual. So a lot of the labs are moving forward with doing this as well. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, yeah, eClinical Works does have a patient portal, and I, I dropped my email in the um, in the uh, chat, and you know, feel free to reach out if you want. But they, we do have a patient portal as part of eClinical Works. What's your name? Uh, Mark Calhoun, M A R E K, last name Calhoun, C A L H O U N, with Care South Carolina, down in South Carolina. All right then, thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, I, I help any way I can. I'm not an expert. Um, so I don't get as much uh, work on the e, e, you know, the system as my staff does, but um, we'll, we'll help you anyway. Thank you. All right. I love that. I've gotten some peer networking and it's my favorite part of the um, Western Forum. Um, there was a question that I got in the chat. Um, they were just asking um, what was more helpful or like what was the benefit in mapping uh, the data versus just graphing it? Um, and then sort of with the, you know, with the intent of how to pitch purchasing a GIS platform, um, 
to administration. Um, and then have I used GIS for any other quality related projects? I will say I have not used GIS for any other quality related projects. And so this, I'm sort of working on um, the bias of this is my sole experience. And luckily it was really good. Um, I think, um, I think in terms of mapping, um, my impression is that gra I mean, graphs are, especially if you don't have access to GIS, like, heck yeah, like graph it, you know, like use any type of visual um, to help get that um, data, you know, in a more viewable form or understandable form. Um, especially when you're working with lots of different numbers. Um, I think mapping is great in that lots of people understand maps, like maps, um, well, <laughs> maybe less so in the days of no one uses a map anymore. We just listen to our phones tell us where to go. Um, but I, I find maps can be understood across professions, even in professions that don't use graphs or like can't break down different types of graphs, especially if it's not a graph that's like a pie chart or a simple bar graph, which this type of data wouldn't really fit well with those types of graphs. Um, not that those graphs are bad, it's just, you know, different data requires different types of graphing. Um, and some professions don't, um, aren't as familiar with different types of graphs. I would also say that like in terms of sort of the community health worker aspect uh, and really getting um, community involved too with like showing them this data of like, hey, like I'm sure you know that this is the reality of like your existence in this community, but now we have it graphed. How would you like us to address this and like starting to have those conversations? Um, I think again, maps are going to be something that people can visualize better versus people who like might not have high literacy um, in, in various areas and aren't going to really be able to sort of look at a graph and know what it's saying. Um, those are, that's, yeah, that's sort of where I'm coming from with it and that it just really, I think is um, a simple, straightforward way of displaying potentially complex data in a way that lots of different people can understand and get involved with it and be engaged with it. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm coming from with that. Thank you for that question. Um, if anybody else has had a different experience um, than that, please um, feel free to, to share. I want to take just a minute to remind people that there is um, an evaluation after this session today. And it's really important because we use this information to take a look at programming and how we can improve, gives you an opportunity to give us some information and feedback. So if you can, take a moment to uh, look in the chat box where we post your evaluation survey. I did get a note back that somebody said that link didn't work yet, um, said that the page was wrong, but I, I just double checked it. So it may, may need just a little bit of time to open that up. I'm going to repost it. Um, take a minute to complete our, our evaluation and we do appreciate your feedback. And then I wanted to remind you, if you're looking for continuing education uh, credits, we did post uh, several times in chat the information for this session so that you would have that. And um, you can actually download and complete the NASW attendance ver verification form in your event survey to get credits, and that's going to go directly to Sylvia Gomez. And her email address is g-o-m-e-z at ncfh.org. Again, it's posted in the 
chat box for you. Oh, and I did get a message back that the link for your um, evaluation worked for someone else, so it may just have been a timing issue. I do have one more question for Lisa, and this is actually inspired by our colleague Maria Retana, who messaged in the chat. Lisa, could you talk about, you mentioned all those great, um, like education that you're doing as a promotora salud with the comunidad and even around COVID vaccine access. Can you talk about how you and other promotoras have adapted your strategies um, through the pandemic to still do that work, but do it navigating a pandemic? Um, yes, um, we are like a group of 10 that we were hired by UTEP through a campaign called Reduce the Risk Kill here in El Paso. And, but we're, we are actually from New Mexico. And it's, it's been a long journey for us, uh, but, but, but since we know the community, Las Promotoras are the ones that know their community, know the people. And the people are very grateful for, for, for our job. And they tell us, thank you for being out here. And um, we register the people for the vaccine. Many people don't know technology, especially the older people. So they're very grateful for us to help them out. And of course we take our distance. We have our face masks, we have our um, hand sanitizer. We, we try to protect ourselves as well as our, as our community. Um, what can I say? Uh, it's been working a great, great deal for the people that really don't know how to register, how to get to the vaccines. Um, uh, and I understand that many have family, have kids, have grandkids, but believe me, <laughs> many of them don't help their these people. They come to us, to the promotoras, and we give out our phone numbers, and they they advocate for us. They 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 send them out to other people, and they say they gave me your number. I think you can help me. And, and they're uh, like I said, uh, our community is very grateful for, for the job the promotoras do. And I, this past year, I think the promotoras as they were, are being recognized more. Uh, I, I didn't think uh, we were cherished or appreciated what we did before, but this year, as the, this past year, the promotoras came out to do what we do best, talk to our people out there. And we are being recognized and we are being paid. It's not now volunteer work like we used to do it. And I think like our, our logo is a promotora se nace, no se hace. You come, cuando naces de ser promotora eres tú. No porque te paguen, no porque haga un puesto grande, es tu esencia de persona. Es una persona que le gusta ayudar. Le gusta hacer su, su trabajo, aunque no se ha pagado, pero cuando se paga, se hace con mucho más ganas. <ríe> so este año pasado vimos que, la, el, que reconocieron que, la, que necesitan las promotoras afuera, no gratis, pero pagadas y protegidas, protegidas todo el tiempo. Este, yo le doy gracias a estas conferencias que sepan que hay promotoras en todo alrededor del mundo. Le digo, nosotros trabajamos con El Paso, Texas, y nosotros somos de Nuevo México. Estamos en el bordo de aquí. So, ayudamos a dos comunidades al mismo tiempo. Y la gente nos reconoce afuera. Y aunque no estemos en, en momento de trabajo, la promotora trabaja 24 a 7, como dicen. Porque si te topan en la tienda, te van a decir, Usted es la que registra, ¿me puede registrar? What do we do? Claro que sí, nunca les decimos que no. Este, soy yo, gracias a ustedes, gracias por el reconocimiento a las promotoras y a los promotores, porque también hay hombres promotores y, y hacen muy buen su trabajo, igual que nosotros las mujeres. So, gracias por la oportunidad y, y de veras les agradezco esta, estas conferencias. Wow. 
Thank you, Maria, for these wonderful words. Y así es, las promotoras no se hacen, las promotoras nacen y nosotras estamos 24-7 eh, trabajando todo el tiempo por nuestra comunidad. Ejemplo, eh, yo vengo de Puerto Rico y pues mi familia es my community here in Washington. Y de verdad que esto es una gran oportunidad de conocernos y seguir este, explorando más recursos que tenemos en nuestra comunidad. Y esto nos ayuda a cada uno a improve uh, en nuestro trabajo. Gracias por, por compartir eso. Thank you for sharing. I know we're drawing to a close. We have a couple of more minutes left. Um, and so if there are any other questions for Lisa or I, um, and if not, and if questions come up later, um, please feel free to contact us. Our emails um, are on the slide set. Um, we're happy to, to network and answer questions um, after the conference. Everybody's so quiet, but I just wanted to say thank you for the information. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for the information. <laughs> thank all of you presenters and all of those who uh, participated. Mm -hmm.